Uh, well, welcome to getting a handle on your dependencies. My name is uh, Dan Silvestru. I'm the co-founder and CEO of BitHound. Uh, we think of ourselves as a continuous analysis for your node project. Um, and the process is basically BitHound has come through due to a huge passion that our CTO and myself have about trying to figure out what it takes to deliver fantastic software. And we're constantly working on analyzing code and dependencies and trying to figure out what information we need to extract to be able to deliver great software. And that's really the, the question. Um, and in this particular case, I'm going to focus on dependencies. And it's not going to be technical, just because I only have 20 minutes. But I'd be happy to discuss all this stuff with uh, you folks after the talk. So what does it take to be able to deliver great software, right? and to be able to do it fast? Well, it goes into a lot more than just your code. Right? At the end of the day, to be able to do it fast, I think we need to start using other people's code. Right? There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. So I'm not going to sit there and write something that's going to do authentication or something that's going to send email. Those have been done already, and I can take full advantage of them. And these days, those come in the form of dependencies, which is fantastic, because it allows us to get our products into production a lot faster. And we get to take advantage uh, or benefit, really, from this tremendous open source community and all of the hard work that they put into these modules, keeping them up to date, fixing bugs, improving performance. The vast majority of them are free to use again, huge bonus. And if we need them updated, or if we need to add certain functionality to them, we have the ability, uh, and in some cases, the obligation, to help contribute to those, um, especially if they're ones that we're using, to help it make better, no, make the whole process better. Um, turns out, of the tens of thousands of projects that we've analyzed on BitHound, it's actually not uncommon to have about 80% of the code that you ship into production not be your own. And this is not a bad thing, right? And it leads me into you know, what I want to talk about, which is supply chain management. Actually, it's not. I'm not going to talk about supply chain management. I'm going to, but I did want to bring it up because as I think about dependencies, I'm often reminded that you know, this is um, a problem and approach that is not unique to software. As a matter of fact, it kind of started off during the Industrial Revolution um, you know, and with Ford on the assembly line. Ford doesn't build cars as much as they assemble them. They design them. They have a set of core components. And then they assemble them um, by getting components from a whole bunch of trusted vendors with which they've negotiated. They've agreed on the exact specifications. There's great quality control measures in place to make sure all the pieces fit together. And hopefully, at the other end comes a drivable car. But in software, we have a bigger problem, right? Our bumpers change version daily, sometimes weekly. And in software, sometimes the act of bolting out a new version of a bumper will make your tailpipe fall off. So we need to kind of manage that. And that leads me to what I'm actually going to talk about. So that's a cute little wombat. I figure it was way cuter than uh, the NPM logo. And as we've seen earlier today um, in some of the numbers that were put up on the screens, NPM uh, right now has over 212,000 packages. It's probably more than that since these numbers are three days old. Um, and sees about 3 billion downloads a month. That's really, really big. As a matter of fact, it's huge. But I think that NPM's biggest strength is also potentially its biggest weakness. So NPM is great in that we can publish a module without any um, real effort. Anyone can get into the game. Everyone can write a piece of code that is hopefully useful and then publish it. And there aren't a whole lot of, of gates that, that prevent us from publishing code. Right? And once the code is out there, it's up to us as a community um, and, and, and organizations and individual developers to 
find what we need and use it. As a matter of fact, the dependency cycle, the way I kind of see it is, initially it starts off with discovery, where we need something to do something, and we'd rather not write it ourselves. Uh, we have to then select the one we actually want to use, integrate it into our code, figure out the usage, um, and then we get into kind of this maintenance mode of I have this dependency, it's sitting there, um, how do I make sure that I'm, I continue to use it correctly? So getting into discovery and selection, uh, I think it was while well, I was at JSConf last week, I, I went on NPM, I don't know if you, yeah, you can see that, um, and I typed in email, um, and I got over 6,500 results. I was like, well, that's fantastic, which one do I get? And I said, well, hold on, I actually, I, I just want to send email. So I got 150 results. I was like, yay, this is great. This is so much better than 6,500. It's still 150 things um, that I need to go and vet. And these days, I don't know about you, but I mean, through blog posts, through talking to friends in the community and other developers, I kind of hone in on the one thing that I think is going to do the job for me and you know, use it. Um, but to kind of better illustrate the process of how I go about picking one, um, I'll kind of, you know, we have JSHint, ESLint, and Standard. Those are three packages that can be argued do more or less the same thing. They lint your code. They help make sure that you stay up with your standards. And if we just look at the numbers uh, that we can easily get off of NPM, um, you know, I find it a little bit difficult to make a decision of which one is better. We're seeing a huge move towards ESLint uh, and standards being adopted and semi-standard as well uh, on a rapid pace. But if all we have to go by is the number of downloads, how many releases uh, they've done to date, when the last release was, um, I think there's still a lot of context that, that we need to be able to make a proper decision. So I'm kind of wondering, like, do we need to start looking at, well, what's the activity level? At what pace are they opening and closing issues and, and accepting or rejecting PRs? Uh, security vulnerabilities, do they have any that might impact my project and how are they addressing them? Um, does code quality come into play? User ratings may be a thing. And, you know, Semver adherence, um, I'm sure how many people got screwed by Semver recently. Just one, two, three, okay. Maybe the rest of you are in denial. Um, but I find that the problem with Semver, although the, the standard is like fantastic, um, it is still us humans that make the decision of what version we go to, and inevitably we all make mistakes, and there are you know, downstream consequences for that. So let's talk about quality first. Um, so there's a bit of a baseline quality thing that, you know. I got these numbers from uh, NodeSource. They've done a great little um, kind of animated graphic um, about uh, understanding NPM. So these numbers are a little bit old, but I think that the percentages still mostly hold. Um, out of the NPM modules out there today, about 6% don't have a README file. Um, I think uh, I can argue with some of the NPM humans on whether or not it is 30% that have no licenses or not no clear definition of a license. But these are the kind of packages and kind of the baseline quality which maybe we need to find a way to red flag and kind of help the community stay away from because it's an indication that there is a bare min like a lack of bare minimum um, understanding of what is the information that you need to provide so that someone can consume your software. And what about code quality? I mean, obviously, at BitHound, we are huge on code quality and do an analysis, um, but should we take that into account when we're selecting um, a particular NPM package? Um, you know, anyone from JS Hint in the crowd? Okay, cool. Um, this is JS Hint. Um, so, and this isn't to, to get a dig at them or anything like that, but just it, it kind of dawned on me that JS Hint, which is a linting framework, doesn't have an ES6 linting config for their test fixtures. I don't, I don't know if that's irony, but I just, things like that that we see in other projects, are there indicators that the project's maybe not fully managed to the, you know, the, the best uh, standards? Now security, this is top of mind for a lot of people. And uh, you know, we're seeing huge investments in internet security companies out there. And, being able to understand whether or not you're potentially exposed to a security vulnerability, um, I think is super important. And with the usage of NPM modules and the whole dependency tree, there is potential for you to be vulnerable to a security um, issue, even though you might not be directly requiring a dependency that is insecure. So when we um, ran 
our analysis on just, we picked 35,000 random projects from our system. Some are NPM modules, some are not. And if we looked at the entire dependency tree, 41% of them had a version of a dependency that had some known security vulnerability on it. And our first reaction was kind of something like this, and we're saying, oh my God, went back and re-looked at our actual numbers to be like, did, did we totally screw this up? Um, and we realized that we actually, we didn't, because your dependency tree could go down very, very deeply. Um, but what we did realize is that there's this tendency to just panic and say, oh my God, security dependency, I have to kill it, I have to fix it, and I can't, do I apply a patch into production? What are the implications of that? And what we realized is really, it, your stuff is potentially insecure as a result of this. Um, I think that the key here is to understand what the impact is of your dependency tree. And if two things line up, light up as being vulnerable, are they vulnerable or are they just potentially vulnerable? Is this um, a case where there is no possible code or no path that your code can take to expose you to that particular vulnerability? Uh, Adam is sitting here in the front row, but as he often says, uh, security vulnerability is basically this module making you a promise that it's gonna do this when you give it that, um, and the result is it does something else. And so now there's a vulnerability. That could be a denial of service. It could be an actual security thing where someone can inject some, some bad code. But the, the important thing is to understand the impact of the security vulnerability on your code base um, and what it is you can do about it. Obviously, if you can patch it if by upgrading, you should, because just because your code doesn't hit a vulnerable path today doesn't mean it won't tomorrow, right? And then, I sometimes ask, okay, so what about my dev dependencies? Because I have a crap ton of those too, right? They do a lot of work for me. And if there's a vulnerability in there, should I really care? Um, I mean, really, I don't deploy those, or at least you shouldn't, and there's ways to make sure that you don't, uh, because everything that you put into production is just increases the attack surface, right? Um, and I often hear it back, I don't care about my dev dependency. This is a dev dependency, it doesn't matter. I found the version that I like. It does everything I need it to do. Go away. Um, and then you get this. So this was kind of cool. Um, this was on Uglified JS. This is a vulnerability that during the minification process of your code, right, as it states, incorrect handling of non-Boolean comparison during minification, which could have actually resulted in code that you didn't expect to run under certain conditions running. So this is an example of a dev dependency that is directly impacting or has the potential to impact your production code. And we tend to kind of leave them by the wayside and not really think about them. But I think it's extremely important that we do, right? Basically, if there's, there's anything I can really start, as we're talking about managing our dependencies, um, and you know, I'm not going to get into too many technical things here, but it's all about understanding that the code that we write these days tends to be glue code with some business logic, and hopefully we put a lot of effort into a really pretty user interface and really think through our user interactions. But a very large bulk of the code that we ship isn't ours. And we tend to take great care to making sure that the code that we write meets standards, right? We write tests, we run lint, you can run it through cyclomatic complexity. We have CIs and build steps that will fill, fail our build and alert us and not let us ship into production if there's anything wrong with our code. But that other 80% that we ship along with our code, there are very few fail checks there. And I think we really need to start thinking seriously about how we manage that code because that code was written by people that we haven't vetted, we haven't hired them, they don't follow our standards, they follow their own hopefully, um, but I think the key to all of this is to really, it starts with knowledge. It's being able to peer into this dependency tree and understand what it is that we're using, how we're using it, and then also make sure that we are addressing any issues that you know pop up. The most, 
I, I was thinking of a whole bunch of different things that I could bring to this talk to say, okay, well, here's the various things that you need to do to make sure that you manage your dependencies properly. And all of that always came full circle back to keep up. Right? Like make sure you're staying as up to date as possible with the dependencies and the NPM packages that you've selected. Excuse me. Um, at the end of the day, you could say, well, this dependency or this version does exactly what I needed to do and nothing else. Right? Um, but what if there's a whole bunch of critical bugs or performance issues that have been fixed over time that you are actually missing out on? More importantly, what if you just have left it by the wayside and by the time there is a reason to upgrade, let's say there is a new security vulnerability that's on the version that you're using, but now you're two major versions behind, so there's breaking changes in each. The effort required to update, now that your manager is breathing down your neck or your security officer is saying, we can't have this, um, could be actually quite onerous. So by keeping up to date, I think um, if a particular dependency stops making sense for you, that's fine. Um, go and get one that's more minimal or you know, write your own if you need to. But um, staying up to date is basically making you or helping you get to that point where um, it's going to be much easier for you to react to the unknowns that are happening from outside of your, of your project. I want to end um, with a very um, simple analogy, if you would. I tend to think of NPM, like as much as there are issues there, uh, we're huge adopters of NPM. We love it. Uh, between our major projects, I believe we have in excess of 130 NPM modules that we take advantage of. And it is frustrating sometimes trying to keep them all up to date. But I look at NPM as a gold mine. It is a great place where we can just walk into. It's free admission. They give you a basket. You can walk around and, and fill it up with precious gems and with gold. And, and walk out, and you're richer for that. But as we dig deeper and hollow out the mine even more so we can get even more diamonds and more gold, we need to make sure that we shore up the walls and the ceiling. Because if we don't, one of these days, this cave's gonna, it's gonna cave in on us and could potentially put us in a very perilous situation. So my two takeaways here are make sure you stay up to date. And us as a community owe it to ourselves to make sure that we help NPM stay you know, in our good graces and that we use it responsibly and that we contribute back when we can. Thank you. <laughs>